Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Aisha Khan and together with Farhana, we are honored to be your hosts today. I'd like to give you a warm welcome to this course, Death, A New Life. Whether you're on the beach in Kenya, in Switzerland, in the UAE, or in the comfort of your own home in the UK, Ahlan wa Sahlan. We've all heard that there is nothing certain in life other than death and taxes. But let's be honest, most people are not interested in death or taxes. So I'd like to thank you, the minority, who have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and are giving us your time today to find out more about this topic. In fact, I can let you into a little secret. Uh, Sheikh Haytham himself, when I asked him a few years ago to cover this topic, was very excited until he discovered that it was not the journey of the soul in Salah and its ascension to heaven that I wanted him to cover, which is his favorite topic, but the shuffling of the mortal coil and the journey of the soul away from the body. He said to me, Aisha, this is a very heavy topic. So we postponed it then. Little did we know that within a few years, death, which affects each one of us at some point um, in our life, at the end of our life or within our life, uh, would affect us simultaneously and collectively. To those of you who have lost loved ones over this past year or before that, our hearts go out to you. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala give uh, <clears throat> his complete and infinite maghfira uh, to those who we've lost from amongst us. And may he give shifa to all those who are sick right now and may he protect us. I mean, uh, we will be taking, uh, we will have three sessions, inshallah, and uh, we will be covering in session one, the how to prepare for death. In session two, how to, um, uh, the journey of the soul. And in session three, how to deal with the loss of a loved one. So um, before I go on, I'd like to introduce you to Sheikh himself, for those of you who are new. Um, <clears throat> Sheikh was, uh, uh, was is Lebanese. He, he, uh, had, uh, the, he was blessed with the opportunity to study with the most uh, eminent and respected scholars in Damascus, mashallah. He uh, accumulated a long list of ijazas and uh, before returned, and then he returned to Beirut where he worked and where he taught at the Sharia College and where he set up um, an office for the research and publication of important manuscripts. He is an expert in Islamic jurisprudence as well as Islamic finance. And he arrived in the UK 20 years ago where he has been spreading the knowledge of Islam. Um, mashallah, he has an unbroken chain of scholarship going back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he has uh, had the opportunity to study with the late Professor, late Professor uh, Wahba al-Zuhaili and Sheikh Muhammad Sukkar and Mufti Taki Usmani, may Allah bless them. I'd like to invite Sheikh Haytham to share his reflections with us. Thank you, Aisha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I told you this is a heavy weight topic. Why you insisted and uh, the current climate pushed me to do this very course. Anyway, it's, it's something we cannot escape, death. So we'd rather be prepared rather than escape the topic. And reality will face every single one of us with this topic. <clears throat> so the COVID-19 and uh, scenario which we have on a daily basis you see on the screens people sorry about it like numbers but they are not numbers they are real souls and real families and real people dying and we are losing so how do we prepare for this it might be today it might be tomorrow allah alam when we will face our destiny so in the first place i'd like to see uh, what is your perception about death? Just in a couple of minutes. Because I'm pretty sure many of us are terrified, scared uh, of death. We are always trying to flip the page and change the topic. We do not like to talk about death. And in our literature and our stories and our minds, uh, in our upbringing, we have a perception about death. So. 
what is your perception about death in the first place? When you hear the word death, what do you think? I'll give you a couple of minutes. Just tell me, what do you think about death? What's in your mind, in your heart about death? Any volunteers? Scared of the outcome. Okay, this is one thing. A journey to another life. Okay, unprepared. We think, we think about grief, about the grave. Glad to meet Allah but scared of prolonged suffering. We think about punishment. Meeting Allah, are we ready? One of the stages of the journey of the soul. Scared about the judgment, scared of the grave. Certain, but uncertain about the outcome. Scared and curious. Being with the ones I love. Relief. Wow. I will know the truth about everything. Meeting my Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Scared of the punishment. Yeah, we all have these worries actually, but it's not doom and gloom. It's not terrifying uh, all the way. It shouldn't be the case. My favorite uh, one, if you want, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa. This is my favorite. Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. So, yes, it's a new birth, it's a new life, as we call our course, death, a new life. It is a new life. Loving to meet Allah is the question. Do you love to meet Allah? Yes. But are we prepared? Again, this is another question, which is heavy. Are we prepared? And more likely 99.99% .99 of us are not, including myself. We are not prepared for death. So this is why we need to keep reminding ourselves about death, not in a negative way that you do nothing but sit down and moan about death and uh, wait for death to happen. No, definitely not. But nevertheless, by being prepared for death, it means as the Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, uh, Sallu or Salli when you pray, pray as if you are leaving the dunya. So when, an, uh, when a Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we imagine narrated in his Sunnah, Kitab al-Zuhud, uh, the Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and we know that the Bedouin's uh, character usually, it's, it's a tough uh, and uh, angry character, usually, not always. Uh, so he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to learn about Islam, and he said, look, teach me, but do not prolong your uh, instructions and teachings. Give me something uh, concise, precise, short, and that's it. The Prophet وسلم, in few lines, he said to that Bedouin, alayhi salatu wassalam, إِذَا قُمْتَ فِي صَلَاتِكَ فَصَلِّ صَلَاتَ مُوَدِّعَ So when you stand up in your prayer, pray as if you are leaving this dunya. Yes? So he directed them how to pray, alayhi salatu wassalam. So when we pray, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you heard this word before. Uh, 
uh, the imams in the mosques sometimes will say to the congregation behind them, Sallu salata muwadda. And sometimes in haram, the imam will say, Sallu salata muwadda. Pray as if you are leaving this dunya. Yeah, this is the prophetic uh, word, alayhi salatu wasalam. So he's preparing us in every salah. You pray, you might not catch the second salah. Allahu alam. By having this preparation in place, you feel that, yes, I will uh, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And having said this, by visualizing death, again, in a positive way, not negative way, then it helps you to prioritize your uh, daily affairs, daily schedule, yes? And it helps you to be uh, connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what we see throughout the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, on a daily basis. When you wake up till you go to sleep. And by the way, we delivered uh, a retreat. Some of you probably attended this retreat. Uh, it was a day with the Prophet والسلام, So we picked a regular day. <clears throat> from his life, alayhi salatu wasalam, we went through the whole day. Since he wakes up in the very uh, night before Fajr, till he goes to sleep, sallallahu alayhi wasalam, what he used to do, he used to say, etc. And you see, uh, in the morning, in the evening, and in between, he's always in uh, a state of a remembrance of death, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, inshallah, we'll start with the first uh, slide. What is the definition of death? So, death in Arabic is maut. In the Quran, we have many verses talking about death and maut. So, in the Arabic language, when you open the Arabic dictionary, al mujam which we call in Arabic, al mujam when you open the dictionary and search for the meaning of death what is it what does it mean death now you read on your slides plenty of things but the summary of these slides if you want to uh, the details of death it talks about uh, stillness so something is dead is it means it's still it's not moving so life is about movement and uh, motion, but death, it's about stillness. So for instance, the Arab will say, uh, this thing is dead. It means it's still, it's not moving. As well, they talk about uh, wind. So the wind is dead. It means there's no wind, it's still, and so on. So in summary, al maut in Arabic, it's the opposite of life, and they are opposites. You, when you open the dictionary, they say death is the opposite of life, and life is the opposite of death. So nobody can be at the same time with two opposites. He is alive or he is is dead. He can't be the two together because they are opposites. And opposites do not meet. So this is in the linguistic definition. And we have other definitions of death. Uh, sometimes you might read about al qiyam al sura So death is about a minor uh, resurrection minor resurrection and there's a book actually which as well we use in our preparation for Sheikh Al-Amar uh, al rahimahullah he called his book Al-Qiyam al sughra he has another book called Al-Qiyam al kubra so the minor resurrection and the great resurrection so minor resurrection is Qiyam al sughra it's about death so anyone who died this is his Qiyamah for him, it's like everyone dies. It's his qiyama, his resurrection. 
and of course the qiyam al kubra it's when everybody dies and then after which we'll talk about later inshallah after the first blow of the horn uh, the first blow of the horn everybody will die yes and then the resurrection will start this is the great or al qiyam al kubra and with that, we, we as well associate with death always the barzakh. Barzakh, which is a barrier between two things. Now, this is the linguistic uh, definition of barzakh because maraj al bahrayni al taqiyan baynahuma barzakh la yabghiyan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Rahman talks about the two seas. They meet together, but there's barzakh between them. There's a barrier between them where the uh, river meet the sea. So the river meets the sea. They cannot mix together. You see the difference or there's like a, a line between the two. The river water, which is not salty water, will not mix with the salty water. There is a barrier between them, barzakh. So Allah used the linguistic meaning here, barzakh. And from the linguistic meaning, we have the sharia meaning. The sharia meaning talks about after death. After death, where the body will be residing, where the soul will go, and this is what we call the barzakh. The barzakh is a new chapter. It's a new chapter in your life. So after death, it's not the end. It's a new chapter. And in the Barzakh, we have plenty of details. We can read about it in the Quran. We can read about it in the Sunnah. So what will happen, inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about this as well, inshallah, in our course. So the day of the Barzakh So death is the inescapable reality of our lives. And Allah Azza wa in the Quran, in many verses, talked about death. For instance, in Surah Ali Imran, Allah says, كل نفس ذائقة الموت وإنما توفون أجوركم يوم القيامة فمن زحزح عن النار وأدخل الجنة فقد فاز وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور So every soul shall taste death You shall be paid your wages in full on the day of resurrection Whoever is removed from the hell and is admitted to paradise shall prosper for the worldly life is nothing but the enjoyment of delusion. Uh, the other verse, or the next verse, كل نفس ذائقة الموت ونبلوكم بالشر والخير فتنة وإلينا ترجعون So every soul, every soul shall taste death. We will try you with a trial of evil and good. Then to us you shall be returned. And then he said, أَيْنَمَا تَكُونُوا يُدْرِكُمُ الْمَوْتُ وَلَوْ كُنْتُمْ فِي بُرُوجٍ مُشَيَّدَةٍ Wherever you are, or you may be, death will overtake you. Even if you are in fortresses, very strong fortresses, it will not protect you against death. So in these verses, you can see, <clears throat> actually, these are very deep verses. So the first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned here, that every soul will taste death. It means everyone will die. And in the very ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ I'll take you a bit into the beauty of the Arabic language. So listen to the word. 
you see the zzz sound. It talks about vibration. It talks about something will happen. For instance, I'll give you an example. If you have a uh, heavy uh, chest on the floor and or safe, and you want to move it, you can't carry it because it's very heavy. So the only way to move it is to uh, push it. So when you push it, you start hearing the sound zzz, zzz, like this, yes? So here, the Quran is, is visualizing for us what will happen. So it means we are close to hell. If we are not doing well, we are close to hell. Unless your good deeds takes you away and it's just pushing you like this, pushing you from hell to Jannah, inshallah. It means it takes effort to move you from going down the hill and down the hill, actually. It takes efforts. It's not that easy. Yes? And in the hadith, the Prophet says, The road to hellfire is like slippery slope. Very easy. Just you let go. You... <laughs> Uh, you take your uh, foot from the pedal and it's just a'uzubillah very easy to 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 hit uh, the hell but tariqul jannah haznun bi rabwa but the way to jannah is like going in the steep way it's it's it takes effort like climbing the mountain it takes effort to reach to the top Yes, but it's it worth it. فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ And again, the word which Allah used here, udkhila, he's been admitted. We don't deserve jannah. We don't say, Ya Allah, I deserve jannah. You can't say this. Yes, we rely on his mercy. We rely on his generosity, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, so you can't say, I deserve Jannah. I'm, I guarantee Jannah. No one can guarantee Jannah. The Prophet وسلم, in the hadith, he says, مَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ بِعَمَلِهِ None of you will be admitted to Jannah based on his deeds. And the companions were, huh? What about you, Ya Rasulullah? He said, even me. And they were more puzzled. He said, even you. He said, yes, even me. Illa an yatagammadani Allahu bi rahmatih. Except if Allah has bestowed his mercy upon me, then I will be admitted to Jannah. And this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What do we understand from this then? Is it that we have no hope? No, no, no. Listen, take a deep breath. I'm not saying this, but the, the message here from the Prophet والسلام, that don't rely on your deeds only. Don't say, yes, the Jannah is in my pocket. I guarantee Jannah that this is arrogance. No, this is exactly what Allah hates, arrogance, no. Say, I have done my best. I hope Allah accepts this from me and admits me to Jannah. This is the way forward. Humility and humbleness, not arrogance. This is the message. The core of the message, this, is this. Yes? So the ayah confirms this. So he will be admitted to Jannah. Allah will admit us, inshallah, to Jannah. Not because we are, um, we have done very good deeds, which is required, yes, but we are not heavily relying on the good deeds. Yes, we do, inshallah, our good deeds. We hope Allah will accept it from us and admit us to Jannah. Yes, so this is the message. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, 
وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ So death, yes, is, is the, the creation of Allah as we'll later talk about this. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ فِتْنَةِ So every soul will taste death, yes, and we will try you with evil and good. During your life, we will try until you go to your grave. Even in your grave, you will be tried as well. The very first thing when the, the, the angels will come and question you, again, inshallah, we'll talk about this later. And the third ayah here, أَيْنَمَا تَكُونُوا يُدْرِكُمُ الْمَوْتِ Wherever you are, or you, wherever you may be, death will overtake you. You have fortresses, you have uh, 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 villas, you have castles, you have, you name it. Doesn't matter. And subhanAllah, we've seen this in our own eyes, unfortunately, in this very pandemic. So even if you were to lock yourself up in your room or in your house or fortress or whatever, this very virus penetrates everything and comes to you. And we've seen many cases, they do not know where did they get it from. You know, the new variation and the, the South African one, they did not know in some places, where did they get it from? They never left the country. They never received anyone from the, abroad and they got it. And this is a proof, it shows you that death can penetrate all borders. Nothing will stop it. And then Allah Azza wa says, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ This is for those who are living in denial. Yes, everything is just coincidental and this is just a big bang and this is the, uh, the, the survivor of the fittest and uh, there's nature controlling everything, mother nature, and there's no creator and what have you. Well, if you are into this belief, it's up to you, but death will face you and then show me your philosophy if it helps you or saves you. So Allah says, do you think that we have created you uselessly and that to us you will not be returned? It's up to you. If you have this uh, belief, feel free but this is the wrong belief and you will pay the consequences of that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says in Surah Al-Mulk, the opening of Surah Al-Mulk, which I believe all of us memorize, تبارك الذي بيده الملك وهو على كل شيء قدير الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور So the one who created the death and life. So life is Allah's creation and death is Allah's creation. Hmm. We understand life is, is the, uh, Allah's creation, it's the soul, etc. But uh, how come death is the creation of Allah? Hmm. Let me uh, uh, share with you this hadith. Uh, <coughs> Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, as Bukhari narrated in, in uh, Sahih, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrated that, and it's a beautiful long hadith. Uh, he said, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يؤتى بالموت كهيئة كبش أملح فينادي مناد يا أهل الجنة يشرئبون وينظرون So he's saying that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said on the day of resurrection <coughs> actually the translation is not very accurate but I, I, I will fix it, don't worry uh, the Prophet didn't say on the day of resurrection the Prophet ﷺ said, death will be brought forward in the shape of a black and white ram. Like big ram. And then a caller will call the residents of Jannah and residents of hell. And they will look 
And then they will be asked this question. Do you know this guy? This very ram, you know him? They will say, yes, we know him. This is death. Yes, so Allah will make death like that. Yes, and it's a metaphorical if you want. So Allah will give death like this shape. So they will know him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will command them, uh, not them, Allah will uh, 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 destined for death to be slaughtered. This ram, which is the, the symbolic symbol of death, that Allah will command this death to be slaughtered. And death will be slaughtered. So death will die. Yes? And then uh, the caller will say, oh people of Jannah, it's eternity, no death after now. Oh people of hell, it's eternity, no death after now. That's it. So this is where we see the, the definition here of death, that Allah created death and death will die as well. Allah created life, a soul which Allah has given to us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the question which probably some of you are asking, in a couple of verses which we recited earlier, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul will taste death. Why did Allah use the word taste? And we know taste is, uh, is, some, is the property of the tongue. Yes? And death, you don't taste death, do you? You taste your food, you taste your drinks. Yes? You don't taste death. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal use the word taste? I'll give you another verse in Surah Ali Amran as well, 181 in Surah Ali Amran. Allah used this very word, Zaqu, Fazuqu al Azaba, or Zuqu al Azaba. Yes? So Allah used the same word with people of hell when Allah will say for them, Zuqu al Azaba, or فَذُوقُوا عَذَابَ الْحَرِيقِ So taste the, the torment of hell fire. Taste it. Again, it's a metaphor, but what does it mean? It means it's real. It's not imagination. It's not a dream. It's not illusion. It's real. As you taste something and it's the closest to you is in your tongue. The closest thing to you is when you put it in your mouth, in your tongue, you feel it, you taste it, you understand that this is real, this is not uh, imagination. So death is like this. It is real. You cannot escape it. It's not imagination. No, you will taste death. So accordingly, do we have a pain in, during death? The Prophet وسلم, he used to say in his dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min sakarat al maut. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the agony of death. Sakarat al maut, which is the agony of death. Yes, it has agony of death. Yes. Uh, but nevertheless, inshallah, Allah will make it easy for the believers. And I, I remember once, or probably a couple of times, uh, one of uh, our students works in uh, ICU and the hospitals. And they told me a couple of times about some cases they came across. They told me that some patients, they were dying, but some of them, it takes few days for the soul to depart from the body. And they were suffering and suffering and they can see them and they can't do anything. And some people, it's just phew, done in no time. SubhanAllah, depends on his deeds, her deeds, what they used to do in the dunya, how they uh, prepared themselves for that. All of this is, is on the list. So, 
So we see, subhanAllah, it's it's something we we tend to, you know, take our mind off this topic. But no, we shouldn't. The Prophet Sallallahu as preparation for death, the attitude towards death, the Prophet Sallallahu used to say, أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَذِمِ الْلَذَّاتِ وَمُفَرِّقِ الْجَمَاعَاتِ Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So remember much the destroyer of pleasures, death. Sallallahu why? Because it puts the believer on the right track. When you remember that you will die, then your plans will change. See somebody, for instance, a, a, a cancer patient. They told them you don't have that much, you will die after, I don't know, a few months. See what was his plan or her plan before that news. And after that, different, different plans. So the Prophet ﷺ gave us this plan on a daily basis. When you wake up in the very morning, you say, Alhamdulillah, ahyana ba'dama amatana wa ilayhi nushur. Praise be to Allah, the one who has gave us life after death, and to him we will return every day. Every day, this is the sunnah, preparation. And when we go to sleep, what is the sunnah supplication when you go to sleep? Allahumma, a couple of dua he used to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the short one and the long one. Bismika rabbi wa da'atu jambi wa bika arfa'u. إن أمسكت نفسي فارحمها وإن أرسلتها فاحفظها بما تحفظ به عبادك الصالحين. So in that very dua you say to Allah سبحانه وتعالى by your name I put my side and I sleep. So if you were to take my soul, have mercy on it. If you were to release it and give it back to me, so uh, guide me to what is best. or protect me with your protection. Protect me with your protection that you have uh, for the righteous people and make me among them. Something along these lines. So again, the remembrance of death is important. Uh, and this is one of the, by the way, uh, one of the uh, uh, cleaning agents uh, for the heart. Prophet Sallallahu in the hadith, he says, in al-qulub la tasda kasada hadid So hearts does, the heart does uh, uh, become rusty. Like iron does. And they ask him, what is the way to clean it or to polish it? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, zikru al maut Remembrance of death and tilawat al-Qur'an, recitation of the Qur'an. So yes, this is the, one of the ways to make your heart soft, to remember death. And the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that uh, when you remember death, it puts a limit in your life, that we need these limits. It helps us to be, to be and stay on the, the, the path, on the straight path. Why? Because I'm going to die. Does it really worth it to do this uh, big fight with this person on something silly of the dunya issues? And it's not worth it. So then you, you change your mind and you deal with things in a different way. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Barzata 
رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا تزول قدما عبدي يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن عمره فيما أفنى وعلمه فيما فعل به وعن ماله من أين اكتسب وفيما أنفق وعن جسمه فيما أبلى <coughs> So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned that on the day of judgment your feet will not move anywhere until you are asked about few things. So the first one, your life. How did you consume it? How did you spend your life? How did you invest in your time? This is number one. Number two, your knowledge. What have you done with your knowledge? Use it for something good, use it for something bad. There are very, very smart people and they have good knowledge about this topic or that topic or this science or that science, but they use these sciences and this, and this knowledge to do evil. Then they will be asked and questioned about the use of that knowledge and the money. Where did you earn your money? How did you get it? From halal, from haram, and not only this, you get it from halal, alhamdulillah, that's good. But he spent it for on haram. Oh my God. You will be asked about where did you put your money? And your body, which Allah has given to you. How did you use your body? These are legitimate questions. Allah will ask every one of us. Uh, Mu'adz, for instance, um, giving some, some examples of the companions of Allah Ta'ala and whom. Uh, before death and there's a book uh, actually uh, collected uh, the last statement of uh, the first generation or from the first and second generation uh, some companions some scholars what did they say when they were on their deathbed yes it shows us how do they see uh, uh, death and it surprises you that some of them were terrified like us. We are terrified, we are scared, we are this and that. But you see the way they have, for instance, uh, uh, dealt with death. And let me read you uh, what Mu'ad radiallahu ta'ala uh, what did he say before his death? And we know Mu'adh bin Jabal, the Prophet وسلم, said that he is the most knowledgeable uh, in my ummah about the halal and haram is Mu'adh. And he is one of the reciters of the Quran, one of the mountains of knowledge and the faqih and uh, the worshipper and you name it. So when he was on his deathbed, he called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Ya Rabb, innani kuntu akhafuk wa ana al-yawma arjuk. I used to fear you, Ya Allah. So in his life, he has uh, made the fear of Allah azza wa jal the dominant in his life. I used to fear you, Ya Allah. But now, I have hope in your mercy so he's getting into the hope rather than the fear of Allah which we call these two wings al khawf wa raja so khawf which is fear and raja which is hope so in these two wings you fly to the akhirah safely inshallah ta'ala so he's saying I used to fear you Allah but now I have more hope. And then he said, Oh Allah, you know that I did not like in this dunya the flowing rivers and the enjoyment of the dunya and the shade of the trees. But I used to love in this dunya fasting in a very hot day and striving to fulfill the obligations. 
and competing with people of knowledge to seek knowledge and attending the circles of knowledge. And then he said, La ilaha illallah. And then he passed away. Rahimahullah. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And the Prophet وسلم, said, The ni'ma al Mu'ad is among the best people, Mu'ad. Radiallahu anhu. And we read a lot as well about uh, what did Abu Bakr say? What did Omar say? And it's. Everyone has his own take on that. Everyone has his own uh, expressions about what he's expecting and how he's meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we were to, to be that person, what would be our statement to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What what do we say to Allah Azza wa Jal in this very moment? Definitely we are relying on Allah's mercy. Probably we might say something along these lines. We don't have that much good deeds, Ya Allah. And if we have some good deeds, we don't know if it's being accepted from you, but we definitely know that you are the most merciful so we rely on your mercy ya Allah and probably it's something along these lines and we see that uh, for instance uh, the Prophet sallallahu as uh, Uqba bin Amr narrated, he said, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this, this is in the last year of, of uh, uh, his life, alayhi wa salatu wa sallam. Well, people, probably the last month of his life even. He said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went out to visit the uh, shuhada of Uhud, those who passed away in Uhud. So he went to the graveyard to Al Baqiya to visit them. And uh, no, sorry, not in Al Baqiya. Uh, the, the, uh, companions who passed away in Uhud, he did not move them from uh, the battlefield. He asked them to bury them where they passed away. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he went to visit them. He knows where they are. So he went to visit them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After eight years, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And Aqba bin Amr is saying that as if we felt he's uh, paying the farewell for them and farewell for this, the whole thing, for the life and everything. And then he came back and then he went to the mimbar and he delivered the speech alayhi salatu wassalam. And they felt that this is a farewell speech. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Uqba bin Amir is saying, this was the last time I have seen his face, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, on the minbar. And he said, by Allah, I'm not afraid that you will commit shirk after I die. But I am afraid that you will compete in dunya and it will destroy you as it destroyed those who were before you. Of course, there's a long hadith uh, he delivered, وسلم, but Uqba is just highlighting this part of the hadith. Yes, so he's highlighting this and he said, this is the last time I've seen him والسلام, on the member, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So again, he prepared the companions for death. 
in different occasions, not only here, in different occasions, he will prepare them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, and he is telling them that be prepared because it's a journey which everyone will take. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have a chart, I'm not sure if um, you can see it. Uh, it's a very uh, condensed chart, shows us what will happen after death, different levels and stages after death. Sheikh, would you like to do that now or after the break? Because it's time for a break. If it's time for the break, then we can pause here uh, instead of rushing it up. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our session today, uh, or now inshallah, we'll talk about uh, a chart first about death. And this very chart is since we die, or even a bit before dying till the final destination which is a summary uh, the scholars uh, have done based on the authentic narrations uh, from the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, what will happen in different stages uh, after death? So you might have sometimes, some people might have illness and die. Some people have no illness, no nothing, they will die. Some people will, might have an accident or something. But going with the common scenarios where you have illness and then uh, during this illness you will get the chance to go into rehabilitation or rectify your your things with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or with people sometimes because you know it's the last and the final uh, time in your life you are spending a, 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 in this life, this special time. So people will usually do their best to ask for forgiveness and um, ask people to forgive them for the things which they have done. And then the last breath, as the Prophet said, uh, whoever says, or his last words were la ilaha illallah inshallah he will be admitted to jannah so this is why we'll talk about this later uh, it's uh, required or recommended to say la ilaha illallah in front of somebody who's on his deathbed not to tell him say la ilaha illallah but say repeat uh, la ilaha illallah around him or her to remind them about uh, la ilaha illallah and then the grave, and then after the grave, you have the uh, su'al, which we call it. So the angels will come and ask you uh, the questions here from the angels. Again, it's a long story what they will ask about. Uh, the, 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 they will ask about uh, who's your Lord, who's your prophet, who's your book, and etc. So those who were doing their salah, they were doing their obligations, they will be able easily to uh, answer these questions. But for those who never done this, they will say, huh, huh, for every question. They will not be able to answer the question. And then after the question, you have a window. depends on your deeds to Jannah or a window to hellfire. And then the first blast will happen, Israfil, the angel of uh, the horn, who's been uh, appointed to blow the horn, Asur, which we call in Arabic. First blast, 
every uh, living uh, being will die, even the angels. With this very blast, all of them will die. Yes. And then the second blast, Allah will resurrect them. And then after resurrection, of course, we have plenty of details. Well, I'm just taking you through the stages. Uh, after the resurrection, we have, of course, during that time, some people will take them 50,000 years in that uh, uh, resurrection, waiting, that waiting period. But for the believers, it's like praying uh, the uh, obligatory prayer. But for others, it will be very, very long waiting time, 50, 50 years or something like this, or 50,000 years, depends on the narrations and the uh, people. Then after the, 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 the resurrection will start, then we have the scales and the scales and where the, the deeds will be weighed in the scale, the two pans. And you have your books or the book of good deeds and so on. So some people will take their book in their right hand, some people in their left hand, some people behind their back. And uh, the smallest deed will be weighed for you in, in your scale good or bad and then accordingly you have after that the, you, you go to the haud of the Prophet وسلم, to his lake so people will go and inshallah all of us will, will uh, drink from the lake or from haud of Nabi وسلم, in his hand and then after the lake after the haud there's a bridge, we go over the Sirat. The Sirat, it's a bridge over Jahannam. So people will go over that bridge in different speeds. Different speeds. Some of them like, like the lightning speed. Yes, depends on their deeds. Some of them like thunder. Some of them like uh, the horse. Some of them like uh, the uh, camel and you name it. And some of them will be crawling. Some of them will be even not able to cross over it. And then we have the intercession. And from the intercession, people, inshallah, will go to Jannah. Some people will not make it, will go to hell. Now, this is in summary what will happen. Of course, we have plenty of details and the scholars wrote books on that, Hadil Arwah, Ila Bilad Al Afrah, for instance, one of that of these books, or uh, the book of Arruh by uh, Ibn Al Qayyim, and uh, Imam Al Qurtubi in his book At Tazkira. Uh, all these books are available in English. You can, inshallah, you, you will find this as well in the list of uh, the references and uh, recommended recommended books to read. So we see this uh, uh, like based on the authentic narrations, yes? And the Prophet وسلم, mentioned many times that be prepared for death in different wordings, in different ways, he وسلم, preparing the Ummah for this destiny. And Allah Azza wa Jal clearly in the Quran says, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, ittaqu Allah, wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghani wa attaqu Allah, inna Allah khabirun bima ta'amaloon. So, O oh you who believe, fear Allah, let every soul look to what it has forwarded for the future, for tomorrow. Tomorrow it means the hereafter. What have you prepared for tomorrow? Every soul should prepare for tomorrow and fear Allah, for Allah is aware of everything you are doing. And do not be like those who have forgotten Allah so that he has caused them 
to forget their own souls. So those are the evildoers who went off the straight path. And we read in the last ayah in Surah Al-Kahf, which we recite every Thursday at the Sunnah evening or every Friday morning. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا So whoever is certain and hoping to meet his Lord, let him do good deeds and associate none with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as you can see, When you have this certainty about meeting Allah Azza wa Jal, then this certainty has to lead us to an action. I'm certain that the flood will happen next week. What do you do to protect your house from the flood getting into your house? You are certain it's happening, but you've done nothing. And this is foolishness. No. This is why, why Allah Azza wa is saying here. Do prepare by doing good deeds. And avoid shirk in, in, in its different forms. Avoid shirk. Whether it's in ibadah or in any other ways and forms. Avoid any form of shirk and worship Allah and, and prepare for that. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he's narrating that uh, what happened. And by the way, the, the, the biography of Abdullah bin Umar is a, an interesting biography and the biography of almost all the companions are very interesting biographies. But Abdullah bin Umar, is a very enthusiastic uh, knowledge seeker and uh, mashallah. <clears throat> he is mentioning here uh, that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, from Al-Ansar and uh, posed this question. Man akyasu nasi wa akramu nasi ya Rasulullah. Who's uh, O Messenger of Allah, who's amongst the believers is the best? And who's among the believers is uh, the best in manners as well. The Prophet وسلم, said, the wisest, yes, is the one who keep remembering death. So the more you remember death, the more you get wisdom. But again, I'll repeat this because don't take it in the negative sense, take it in the positive sense. So if you know that death is happening, so you go and do good deeds. You fix your uh, broken relationship with your parents sometimes or with your siblings or with your friends or with uh, somebody uh, dear to you you go and fix it because death is very close. A project which you want to do, which is so useful and beneficial, you keep postponing because you are busy in doing other things. You put this as a priority because this will be in your record when you die and so on. So yes, the wisest is the one who keep remembering death. And it will change the way you deal with dunya around you. 
it will change your priorities. As we've seen, unfortunately, in this very pandemic, you tell me uh, one and a half year ago, what was your uh, priorities? What were your priorities on, on the list? And what is your priority now? You, you just make a compar comparison between these two lists before COVID, after COVID. You see in your own eyes. Yes, death gives you more wisdom, helps you to be more uh, in touch with the akhirah rather than the dunya. And in another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, Al kayisu man dana nafsa wa amila lima ba'da al maut, wa al ajizu man atba nafsa wa hawaha wa tamanna ala Allah. So the wise man is the one who calls himself to account before death and does good deeds to benefit him in the hereafter. But the foolish is the person who follows his own desires. And then he relies on Allah and say, yeah, Allah will save me. Allah will give me this or give me. No, you need to fulfill your obligations. Don't do that. In the other hadith, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has Al-Bara' bin Azib narrated. He said, uh, we were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he stood at the edge of a grave and he cried, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. Then he said, oh my brothers, for this you should prepare yourselves. لمثل هذا فأعدوا صلى الله عليه وسلم As you can see death was before his eyes عليه الصلاة والسلام and he wants us to have this very same feeling because it gives us the real perspective. And then you see the dunya in a different lenses, in a different lenses. Dunya will be fade. Again, I'm not saying you isolate yourself, you do nothing and then you kick the dunya in your uh, foot and then, I'm not saying this, but it gives you what is uh, reality of al akhirah The real life is the akhirah The dunya is just a bridge to the akhirah So prepare for the real life and don't be consumed by this life. So prepare for death by doing what? The chart which we have here or that this uh, kind of uh, quick summary of how can we prepare for the akhirah. Of course, number one, we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to act upon this in private and public. We are not just fearing Allah azza wa jal in public and in private we do just wild stuff and things which are not in line with that, no. We fear Allah in secret and in, in public as well. And the second thing we need to uh, observe our obligations. On the top of it is salah. Salah, nothing matches the salah in, in ibadah. It's the most important ibadah, salah. And in the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that إن أول ما يحاسب به العبد يوم القيامة من عمله صلاته. The very first thing of your deeds, which the servant will be asked about on the day of judgment, and he will be held accountable for it, is his salah. The very first thing. 
فإن صلحت فقد أفلح وأنجح if it was good then he has succeeded وإن فسدت فقد خاب وخسب but if it wasn't good then he has lost he achieved failure and loss so be careful salah is so important and don't postpone it do it on time and then the second the third thing establish special relationship with the quran uh, the quran will be your companion in your grave do we have some uh, solid authentic narrations on that we have a couple of narrations not very let's say strong narrations we have some weak narrations but nevertheless um, establishing good relationship with, with the quran uh, is is important because the quran gives you uh, direction and guidance and enlighten your heart enlighten your life yes Be occupied and engaged with good deeds and refrain from uh, major sins. And as well the minor sins, but you cannot guarantee that you will refrain from minor sins as well. But when we have minor sins or anything, we keep asking for it still far and we seek re repentance and forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do tazkiyah by reflecting on your deeds often and much. How do we do Tazkiya? Doing Tazkiya, it has different uh, dimensions actually and different things to be done. Uh, of course, we have to uh, do the obligations and refrain from prohibitions. This is the definition of Taqwa. And this will protect your heart, protect your uh, uh, actions from anything which doesn't please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then check have you done anything uh, which uh, displease Allah azza wa jal? then seek forgiveness and ask for repentance have you violated someone's right and have you went beyond, beyond the boundaries and so on and so forth so try to do small accountancy to yourself before the real accountancy happened in the akhirah Take yourself into account before you are taken into account on the day of judgment. Learn and improve your knowledge because the more you know, the more you fear Allah, the more you are closer to Him. Learn, be engaged in, in, in regular circles. This will make you closer to Allah and bring you back on track, inshallah ta'ala. It will strengthen your iman as well. have good companionship around you because good friends will help you to elevate your status and be inshallah ta'ala among the righteous people and bad friends will just push you down so be careful whom to choose as friends how to soften your heart as well it's through uh, uh, attending funerals because by attending funerals, you can see that I, I will be here one day. Allah alam when. Visit uh, patients. Because when you visit patient people, ill people, sick people, uh, it, it reminds you about the favors of Allah on you. That you see, Alhamdulillah, I, I don't have this illness. Alhamdulillah, I can move. Alhamdulillah, I can breathe properly. I don't need any machines. And so on. So it, it gives you this uh, tranquility back. Because I know some people are, and we might be sometimes like this, moaning about this and that and the, the, the nitty gritty. And when you go and visit the ill people, when you see people's uh, troubles and, and afflictions, you find yourself in, in bliss. Yes. So it helps you to, to 
be more focused and visit the graveyard because it reminds you about the akhirah as in the hadith. And when you go to bed, uh, keep your azkar in the morning, in the evening, yes? And have a clean heart before you go to bed. So rewind and delete. Don't keep this uh, uh, daily uh, uh, bad deeds which happened to you, for instance, or somebody has done something wrong to you. Yeah, just forgive and open a new page. Don't have any rancor, any hatred, anything in your heart towards anyone. Forgive everyone. I know some of you might say it's so difficult. It's not that easy. I know, but the Jannah as well is not that cheap. So you need to strive to get into Jannah, inshallah. And we know the story of that companion who the Prophet Sallallahu said, today you will see a man from paradise. And then they see this very companion coming forward. For three days, uh, he repeated the same thing, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the same man. So the story, as probably most of you know the story, that the core of uh, the actions which he was doing, apart from, of course, his obligations, Salah, Siyam, etc., uh, he said that he will never go to sleep without forgiving everyone who wronged him. So he will have a clean heart. And the last thing, uh, seeking repentance, often and much. So we always ask Allah for uh, forgiveness. We always ask Allah for to, uh, to, to uh, accept our repentance. So we beg Allah for repentance and that for acceptance. And don't forget, increase your adhkar and your remembrances, especially la ilaha illallah, because la ilaha illallah is the most important dhikr. Yes, the most important dhikr is la ilaha illallah. Although there is some uh, sort of weak to uh, a bit more than a weak narration says, and the best uh, that I have mentioned or I have said, the Prophet Sallallahu is saying, uh, is la ilaha illallah. Afdal ma qultu ana wa nabiyuna min qabli la ilaha illallah. The best thing that I have said and the previous prophets before me was la ilaha illallah. Although it's not a very strong narration, but there are plenty of other narrations confirms the importance of la ilaha illallah. So it deletes the sins. The more we remember uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, the more it takes and deletes our sins. Now, how to do the repentance? The, the common question probably my, many of us might ask. How to do repentance? What is the proper way to do repentance? The scholars actually wrote around four to five uh, conditions. So condition number one is to regret what you have done. To regret, not to uh, to show off about what you have done, as the social media these days, uh, just sharing the, the sins. No, you should regret what you have done. This is number one as a condition for repentance. And... You should desist from committing it. Yes. And decide not to do this again. Okay. So you stop what you are doing. If you are, you've done this, then you stop it. Don't do this again. Then have the intention not to repeat it. Have the intention that I will uh, ask for forgiveness and ask Allah Azza wa to accept it from me. And if this very sin was connected to a third person or a second or, or a second person, then you need to seek his forgiveness. Say, for instance, you have insulted him or you've done something wrong to him or her, 
then you need to ask their forgiveness in order to be forgiven and in order to have uh, uh, sincere repentance. Otherwise, it won't be sincere repentance. So the Prophet وسلم, mentioned in the hadith sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he used to ask Allah for, for, for forgiveness in some narrations 70 times and some narrations uh, 100 times sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's teaching the ummah that yeah, you need to ask for forgiveness all the time. And by the way, uh, the, the remedy for uh, uh, anxiety and the remedy for uh, uh, some heavy burden on your shoulders, the hadith is giving us uh, a way out. Whoever continuously says istighfar, so Allah will relieve his concerns and give him a way out of any anxiety or any trouble. So increase istighfar increase is still far it will give you a soft heart and will relieve you from the burden inshallah ta'ala so we need to ask for forgiveness and, and tawbah as well but at the same time continuously ask for is still far whether we've done something wrong or not which i doubt because we always do things wrong may allah forgive us subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> And uh, as well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in the hadith that Allah loves the person who repent. Yes, in, in the Quran, actually, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabin wa yuhibbu al-mutattahirin. Allah loves those who keep repenting and who keep purifying themselves. So yes, Allah loves the person who keeps repenting and coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has given sallallahu alayhi wa an example of somebody who has lost his camel in the desert and he has no way to to survive without his camel to deliver him out of this chaos then uh, he did find his camel after he slept and he lost hope he searched and searched and searched he couldn't find it he slept and he woke up and he did find the camel. And he was so pleased with the camel to the extent that he committed a mistake by uh, saying the wrong statement and the wrong uh, supplication. And out of his uh, joy, he said, Allahumma anta rabbi wa ana abduk. Uh, instead, sorry, he said, Allahumma uh, So out of joy, he committed a mistake. He said, oh Allah, you are my servant, I, I am your Lord. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, he committed a mistake out of joy because he's so pleased he didn't know what he's saying. But of course, definitely he meant, I am your servant and you are my Lord. So he's saying that Allah is pleased with the repentance of his servant. It means Allah wants us to repent and be upright and be close to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and subhanallah you see that as well uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us in difficulties sometimes but these difficulties like our situation nowadays and I've delivered many reminders on this topic, actually, and you can read some of these blogs on our website. Uh, what is the message behind a calamity or a heavy test? What is the message? I often receive uh, many questions from people. How do we know that this is a punishment or this is a trial or this is um, uh, elevating our status or this is, I don't know. How do we know? And my typical classical answer usually is, uh, it's up to you. 
if you did know, if you do know that you have committed plenty of awful stuff, or not necessarily to be plenty, some awful stuff, enough. And then afterwards you received a calamity from Allah, heavy trial from Allah. What do you classify this? Obvious, Allah wants to punish you, might be, or wants to purify you. So, but you can't remember that you've done something very wrong, probably small things, but not very wrong, but the trial was big. Then it's not a punishment. What is it? It's moving from level one, I usually say from level two. In order to get into level two, you need to go through the exam. And the exam has to be tough. So you need to be prepared and understand that this is an exam. So Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَمٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ أَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْبَأْسَاءِ وَانْضَرَّاءِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَنْضَرَّعُونَ We have sent messengers to communities before you. And we afflicted them with misfortunes and hardships so that they may be humbled they may come down on their knees and show their weakness to me and beg me and show their uh, sincerity and this is exactly what we need to do show allah Azza wa Jalla that we are sincere and we need his support we need his help we would Shaykh, can i please sorry sorry to interrupt you Shaykh, but I, it's a time to break for maghrib salah Okay, and I this is a few this. slides together, so... Inshallah, I will finish this and then we'll break, inshallah. So the Prophet ﷺ then is telling us that, yes, repent to Allah Azza wa Jal, repent, and uh, even if it's huge or big uh, sin you have done, the, the, the repentance or the gate for repentance is open. Come to Allah Azza wa Jal and He will accept your repentance. But you need to be sincere and humble and always trust that He will accept your repentance if you were sincere. Inshallah, we can break here and come back after Salah bismillah ta'ala to resume our uh, session. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. Alhamdulillah, we prayed in Maghrib. We ask Allah to accept from all of us our prayers and our good deeds. <clears throat> so Allah will resume what we have started. Uh, how do we prepare ourselves to receive trials and afflictions and uh, hardships from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So we see in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned that he has tested and will test as well uh, us. He tested prophets and messengers, he tested previous nations, and he will test us as well. The Prophet وسلم, was tested as well. A, and in this very narration, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as uh, Ibn Mas'ud who said, that I remember the Prophet Sallallahu he was talking about a prophet who's been beaten up by his uh, people and his face was uh, full of blood. And he made a supplication and dua for them by saying, Allah forgive my people because they are definitely do not know. Certainly they do not know. So he's doing dua for them. And uh, of course, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi here is, is including himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he, he did face this in uh, the incident of at taif when he went to at taif and then they went and pelted him and he was bleeding, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not from his face, but from his uh, feet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he was so merciful and with that in place, he's supported by the revelation, he's the chosen one, he's a messenger of Allah, but he was tested, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we will be tested as well. And Allah says in the Quran, وَبَلَوْنَاهُمْ بِالْحَسَنَاتِ وَالسَّيِّعَاتِ 
So we tested them with uh, fortunes and misfortunes. So sometimes we might think that, hang on, uh, fortune is a, is a test. Yes, some people will be given uh, fortune, money, uh, you name it, status, uh, position, and it will be a huge test. Not just uh, he's been afflicted by, I don't know, uh, severe illness or something along these lines. No, test can be as well through uh, wealth, through positions, through status, through power, you name it. <clears throat> And a very common uh, ayah, which we, we all recite, especially these days, Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, وَلَا نَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعَ in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَنَقْصٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ We will test you for sure with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits and give good news to the patient five things Allah has mentioned here fear hunger loss in uh, wealth in lives in crops and unfortunately we witnessed the five in this very pandemic we witnessed the five so Allah is saying that give good news for those who are patient. Ah, and when we have uh, a test, we, on the other side, we need to have how to face it with sabr, patience. We have illness, we need patience, and so on. And in the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, he said that the greatest the trial the greatest the reward. And if Allah loves some somebody, he will test him. So if you have a test, I don't think it's, it's a revenge or it's a punishment. Probably it's, it's a, a, an act of love from Allah Azza wa Jal. He wants to elevate your status. He wants to make you leave the dunya with no sin on you and you have a high rank. And without that, you won't be able to do it yourself. So it's a test, but at the same time, it's an act of love. <clears throat> and the other hadith, Prophet Sallallahu said, is a safar al-abdu, Omarid. So if you are ill or you are traveling, Allah will write down for you what you used to do before your illness uh, and before your uh, journey, as if you were uh, with no illness or you, you've never traveled. I.e. You, you used to do before illness uh, this much of uh, good deeds, this much of prayers, this much of uh, voluntary stuff and so on. But because you are ill, you can't do that. You can't match that. Allah will write it down for you as if you have done it because you used to do this. So we see that the mercy in, in even the tribulations or the hardships which we receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma yusibu al-Muslim. So the Muslim will not be afflicted by any discomfort or illness or anxiety or grief. Even the, the smallest thing like a pricking of a thorn, but Allah will expiate his sins on account of his patience. So anything you face as, as a test You've been afflicted with like illness, like uh, tiredness, like you name it. Then Allah will remove from your sins because of that. If you were acting with patience, of course. And once the Prophet Sallallahu said to Umm Al-Ala, one of the female companions, he said, have good news. Abshiri. 
because the illness of the believer takes away his sins, just as the fire takes away impurities in gold and silver. And in another narration, the Prophet وسلم, mentioned that uh, <clears throat> the illness will remove your sins exactly like the a tree sheds its leaves. In autumn, you see that trees shed their, their leaves. So illness will take away your sins like that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to repeatedly saying, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min zawali ni'matik wa tahawwuli afiyatik wa fuja'ati ni'matik so he used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Oh Allah I seek refuge in you From the decline Of your favor From change in Granting well-being From sudden uh, From your sudden Anger And from anything that displeases you. And the story which I already mentioned earlier regarding at taif when he went to at taif Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his way back, he made the dua, etc. It's a beautiful supplication. Allahumma inni ashku ilayka da'fa quwati wa qilla tahilati. Long uh, dua, beautiful dua. So, I, I do complain, Ya Allah, about my weakness to you. And in that very dua, he mentioned, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you are not displeased with me, then I don't mind. Even if you were to test me like this, I don't mind, but I, I fear that you might be displeased with me. And then he said, So I, I seek your uh, mercy rather than the hardship. I seek ease rather than the hardship, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it shows us that he used to, to read things in a different way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'll go through uh, some etiquettes which we need to observe in place when we visit some ill people because as you can see, the, we went through the chart earlier and the, the last uh, thing you might have before death might be illness. And we've seen plenty of people who are ill and then they passed away, which is the very common thing. So what are these etiquettes which we need to observe and uh, have in place? The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that the Muslim has over his brother six rights, six rights. What are these six rights? And he mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first thing, when you meet him, you have to greet him, number one. Number two, if he uh, invited you to a wedding, to Walima, something along these lines, then you need to accept his, his invitation. If he, number three, if he asks for uh, counsel or a good advice, you give it to him. Number four, if he sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah, then you say, Yarhamukallah. Number five, if he was ill, this is why we brought this hadith here. If he was ill, you need to visit him. So this is one of his rights upon you. And number six, if he passed away, you'd follow his funeral, his channel, that this is his right upon you. Of course, taking into consideration the lockdown, the, the social distancing or what have you, whenever it is possible, then do it. If not, then khairan, you do whatever is possible. <clears throat> In the hadith, which is beautiful hadith, 
regarding visiting the ill and the sick. Uh, the Prophet said, عائد المريض في مخرفة الجنة حتى يرجع The one who is visiting the sick in fact is somebody like in uh, the, the fruits of a garden as if he is visiting the garden in paradise until he come back until he comes back so it means it has a high reward what are these etiquettes to take into consideration? Number one, you have to have a good intention. Before you visit anyone, you have a good intention. Some people will go and visit a sick person to, to uh, you know, uh, revenge from him and say, yes, you deserve it. No, have a good intention. Have a good intention and go and visit the ill, if it's possible, when possible. Uh, choose the right time that suits them if as well uh, 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 the visits are allowed. The visitor should, as we see in the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, he used to ask, how are you? How are you keeping? So ask about how is he, how is she, how are you feeling? Yeah. Uh, don't prolong your visit. Some people, again, I, I witnessed this many times will come and visit a sick person and they will stay. They will bring with them uh, a glue and put it on the chair. Come on, he's an ill person. Just five minutes, few minutes and then leave. Unless he asks you to stay longer because he feels comfortable in your presence. He loves you. He, you are one of his best friends or the best friend or something along these lines. He asks you to stay longer, and it's safe to stay longer. It's not troubling him. Then fine, you you respond to his request. Make a prophetic dua when you visit a, an ill person, like Allahumma Rabban Nas So he used to put his hands, Allah on the person, uh, if he was a, a male, of course not a female, he will put his hand on him and say, Allahumma Rabbi Nas, for instance, on his head, say, Allahumma Rabbi Nas, adhib al-bas, ishfi anta shafi la shifa illa shifa uk shifa an la yughadiru saqama. So he will make his dua, or this dua, or something along these lines, something similar, uh, as in the other hadith. So remove the trouble and heal the patient. You are the healer, no healing, uh, but yours, ya Allah, uh, heal him. Uh, in a way that leaves no ailment. Uh, in the other hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that if you visited a sick person and it's not destined for him to die yet, and you were to say uh, <coughs> seven times, seven marat, Allah as'alullah al-azim, Rabb al-arsh al-azim, an yashfiyaka illa afahu Allah min dhalika al -marad. So if you were to say, uh, I ask Allah, the greatest, the Lord of the great throne, to heal you seven times. Astallah al Azim, Rabb al Arsh al Azim, an yashfiyaka. You repeat this seven times. It's not destined for him or her to die. They will, inshallah, be uh, cured by Ithnillah Taala. So this is what he used to do, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the patient, when he visits them. And you remember this uh, hadith we, which we quoted earlier, Umm um, al-Ala hadith, that the illness uh, will take away the sins. Again, if you are acting with patience, not moaning and not complaining and not be careful, don't do that. Ibn Abbas narrated that the Prophet وسلم, uh, visited somebody uh, uh, and he was ill and he said لا بأس طهور إن شاء الله لا بأس طهور إن شاء الله So he said no harm inshallah this will be a purification for you. So this is like cheer him up. And this is one of the etiquettes as well, to cheer him up and say good news for him. Yes, 
that don't worry, this illness, inshallah, will take away your sins. This illness will purify you. This illness will elevate your status. So these kind of things. And this is one of the etiquettes. Remind him about the good deeds which he used to do. Because sometimes he might be terrified and scared that I might die. I don't know if I've done enough. Uh, yep. Say, inshallah, you have done this, you have done that. You are always praying in the mosque. You are always helping the, the uh, poor people. And remind him about good things to cheer him up. Uh, as well about the importance of sabr and not to complain. And remind him about his salat, about uh, have always a good opinion about Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes? And probably <clears throat> uh, one of the things which, which we need to uh, take into consideration as well. Uh, this person who's ill, has he written his will? He might die. Okay. Have you written your will? What shall you do? So there are, this is, there's a chart here. We need to uh, just go through it very quickly because we don't have that much time. So in, in that chart, we see what have you done regarding the organ donations? Have you ticked the box, yes or no? Uh, is it allowed or not? We have different views from uh, Islamic point of view regarding different schools and different opinions and different what was on that. But nevertheless, one of the very valid uh, authentic uh, opinions that yes, organ donation uh, is allowed. It's not, it's not compulsory, but it is allowed. So somebody wants to do that and he can tick the box. Uh, the details of uh, the, the organ donation, it's, it's a full course, inshallah. Uh, where to be buried as well, you have to, to tell people because some people might uh, write something but not record it or not witness it and then it will be lost. Where to be buried? Some people want to be buried here in this very country. Some people want to be buried somewhere else, back home or I don't know where. Regardless of now permissibility of moving the body from city to city or place to place, but nevertheless, you write this down in your uh, will. Uh, <clears throat> buying your burial plot, it is part of preparation. Or you have already a plot, part of preparation, that's fine. Um, you make your own will. How do you do this? It has to be definitely um, Sharia compliant will. So taking into con this consideration in your will, the missed obligations, for instance, you didn't go to Hajj and you want to go to Hajj, you were about to go to Hajj, you didn't go. Then you put in your will, I want to perform Hajj. Uh, I have not paid the zakah this year or I missed the zakah for a couple of years. You write it down. You have nazar. Nazar, you have promised to do something and you didn't do it and you have to fulfill the nazar then you have to write down things which you didn't fulfill as a vow or a nazar. Uh, <coughs> debts, you write down your debts and receivables, loans, you write it down. Now one third to charity. You are allowed to donate one third, but on your deathbed, I'm afraid you can't do that. The heirs can reject it. If they accept it, then that's fine. If they challenge this, done. You can't do it. Before your death, you can donate one third of your uh, wealth, that's fine. And of course, it has to be dated and witnessed uh, and checked from a specialist in Sharia compliant ways. Now, other things which you go through, like uh, uh, home, home to co contact when uh, this will happen and uh, the funeral services, etc., which will give to you, inshallah ta'ala, in, in the uh, list of things which you will read later, inshallah. 
So the very famous hadith, which uh, we read here and on this slide, Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that uh, you, you should not uh, go to sleep without having your will ready. So yes, we need to prepare our will because you never know um, when we will die. So preparing the will, yes, is part and parcel of preparation for the Akhirah. And what do we do regarding inheritance? Because this country is not an Islamic country and how do we divide the wealth? It is exactly what we said. You see a specialist in Islamic wills, then he will write for you different scenarios and different possibilities, or you can say, it has to be divided in accordance to the forced airship in the, in the Sharia. That's, that's enough. Then who will execute it? You put the executor, this name, that name, then you can refer to a scholar or an imam or whomever you want. And this is how they fulfill your uh, will, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, another point which we have in place, sometimes the uh, parent will uh, give, in, in their lifetime, uh, they will distribute their wealth in their lifetime. For instance, he has a portfolio of uh, 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 properties. Yeah, he will say, okay, I will give the boys each uh, uh, one flat or one house and the girls, I will give every two girls one house. And he thinks that this is the right way to do it because the boys takes two, the girls takes one. No, it's not the right way. This is the right way after death. In your lifetime, this does not apply. In your lifetime, you have to equalize your gifts. And this is exactly what the Hadith is saying here. Nu'man bin Bashir mentioned that his uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, he went to the Prophet وسلم, with his dad. His dad gifted him something, a garden or something. And uh, he wanted to be witnessed by the Prophet. And the Prophet the first question he asked, he said, have you gifted the rest of your children the same thing? Uh, Nu'man bin Bashir, or his dad actually, Bashir. He said, no, the Prophet Sallallahu said, then ask somebody else to witness this. This is injustice, I will not witness it. Yes. And in another narration, Prophet Sallallahu said, be fair between your children, act equally between them. It means you have to distribute your wealth in your lifetime, if you want, equally. One property, one property. One girl, one boy. That's it. Equal. So you cannot uh, distribute it as if after death. Okay. So this is something to take into consideration. I'm pretty sure many people are confused about this. This is why I pause a bit here to show you that this is the wrong approach. So what the right approach is, is what I already mentioned to you. Uh, actually, this is the end of our course for today, inshallah. We still have uh, two topics to cover, the journey of the soul, what will happen afterwards. And uh, we have the lasting uh, grief and how you cope with grief and the mental and uh, spiritual uh, mechanism. Inshallah, we'll open the floor for your questions and your comments. Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh. Uh, could please uh, people raise their hands if they'd like to unmute themselves? And uh, we already have one question on the chat, Sheikh, which is, is the one third, can the one third inheritance be given to children after death, uh, giving preference to one child over another after death? That's a good question. Let me tell you. The one third, it cannot be given to the children. One third has to be outside the family because the forced airship, they take the whole money 
of the parents. This is the first airship and the division in the Quran and the Sunnah. They take the whole money. So you take out of the whole money one third, can't be given to them again. If you want, you give it to, to somebody who's outside the family, not inside the family. Yes? None err. Yes? And sometimes, let me give, give you a very uh, uh, common uh, scenario. He fostered a child, or in our uh, probably expression this, uh, in this country, he adopted a child. Reality is he fostered a child. This is not his child, but he fostered him all his life, etc. So can you give one third to him? Of course, because he's not an heir. So you can give one third to him. Yes. Qasim, would you like to ask your question? You have to unmute him. Yeah, I've sent him the request. Assalamualaikum. I think it's working now. Great. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, I wanted to ask you one follow up to what that uh, question you just answered was, which is um, it's a bit loyally of me, and then I, uh, my own question separately from that. But to follow up from what you just answered, Sheikh, can you? Um, can you uh, uh, gift something like, um, I know that in other communities you, you sometimes gift uh, something like um, maybe teaching, maybe if I wanted for my children to attend some courses, could I pay that to a charity to give them that even though they're the heirs? Could that be from the one third? How much you are talking about? No, maybe a few thousand pounds, maybe even, you know, some yeah, training it's, courses. Are expensive. It's not a big deal because that's fine. And it won't be the core of your wealth. And, and people do not usually fight on 2000 pounds. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the, the fight will happen when you have, you know, six figures and so on. Mm -hmm. Actually, Sheikh, my other question was about fighting which is, uh, um, there's uh, two verses in Surah Al-Baqarah which talk about um, uh, uh, and encouraging you to make a bequest, uh, a will for your parents and your relatives. But then there's a, the, one of those verses says, uh, if I can just read it to you, then whoever alters it after he has heard it, the sin is only upon you. Yes. Yes. So, so then the ayah afterwards says that if you fear um, an error from the one who the, wrote the will, um, and you can correct it. So I just want to know what, what is this, these two verses talking about? No, yeah, these two verses, you need to read the reason behind the revelation. It was talking about a certain incident happened in his lifetime, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And these verses were revealed to give the direction what to do, what not to do. Yes, so it is relevant to a certain incident happened, but w whatever uh, similar incident uh, to that, we can apply the same measurements and the same thing. It, in in uh, summary, if you feel that he's writing a will and he is acting with uh, uh, oppression in his will, yes, mm -hmm. so you can correct it. Instead of saying, I prevent all my children, the boys from my inheritance, da, 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 da. This is haram and this is not Sharia compliant. So you will not write this for him. Yes? Mm -hmm. So you fix it. If you were to do this, that's, that's uh, fine. This is not haram to be done. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sister Rafia, would you like to ask your question? I've sent a request to unmute you. Psycho, can you hear me? Hello. Um, um, Chef, sometimes um, I experience times in my life where death becomes sort of like an obsession and I lose sleep or you know, I can't eat and there's like this overwhelming uh, feeling of despair. 
I mean, obviously it's, it's probably not a healthy approach to have, but how do we moderate like the fear that we have and still remember death without um, being so overwhelmed by it, basically? Yeah, this is why I repeated since the beginning of this course till probably the end, <clears throat> that yes, we need to remember death, but in a positive way, not in a negative way. Because the negative way, exactly what you mentioned earlier, that it will freeze your life and you will die before you die. No, this is not required. No. As the Prophet says, if a qiyama started and you have something in your hand, like a small plant, plant it. And don't say, no, it's qiyama now, let's throw it and just run away. No. He said, do continue your work. So it means you need to live your life. Of course, be prepared for the akhirah, but don't freeze everything and don't be overwhelmed by the fear that freezes your life and, and makes you uh, disabled, i.e. can't do anything, just sitting and doing nothing but uh, acting with anxiety. No, this is not healthy. Uh, the other thing probably is, is relevant here, that I am meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It can be any time. Now, tomorrow, Allah alam. But uh, let me just live my life as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran and the Prophet and the Sunnah. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati. My life and my death is for Allah. So let's make our life for Allah Azza wa Jal. Live by his word and deliver his message. This is what boosts our, uh, if you want, positivity and uh, the good, good side the, rather than the bad side or the uh, half empty side, if you want. Yes, uh, if Sister Ghazala would like to ask her question, I will just unmute her. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, Sheikh, last week I had to bury my mother. May Allah forgive her sins and save her from the punishment of the grave and garner her place in Jannah al And um. what I'd like to do. Is I'd like to visit the grave. No, this only happened last week. And I'm sorry, I'm just getting upset thinking about it. And what I'd like to know is, what are the etiquettes? I know you're going to visit, cover this later on, but I'm going to, oh, I'm going to probably visit the grave before you cover this in your series of lectures. And I just, if you could just quickly tell me what my what I can and can't do. So some people are saying you can put flowers on the grave. Some people are saying you can't put flowers on the grave. Some people, you know, I'm from the Pakistani culture. They say you have to recite Surah Yasin. You have to recite Quran by the grave. And it's a sin if you don't. And then some people say, no, you don't say Quran at the graveside. So just these little things. I don't want to do anything that will harm me in the Akhirah. And I don't want to do anything that will harm my mother. Of course, of course. Because may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower her with his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive her, elevate her status and enlighten her grave and make it peace of Jannah inshallah ta'ala uh, what can and can't be done you can visit the grave definitely but definitely don't cry and shout and moan and do yeah. these kind of things which are not allowed uh, you can recite the Quran, definitely you can recite the Quran, whether it's Surah Yasin or Al-Fatiha or short surahs or anything else from the Quran, that's fine. Make dua for her, ask Allah Azza wa Jal to uh, forgive her. And this is in summary what can be done and can't be done due in, in your visit to the graveyard. Can we put flowers on the grave? Because some people are saying that you can, you can. Any green, any green plant, which has a, a life, if you want. So, if you were to plant a green plant uh, or flower, that's fine. But green plant, this is what he used to do, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Sheikh, you explained to us that this was because plants do tasbih? Because of the tasbih which they are doing. As long as they are alive, they would do tasbih. So, Sheikh, what about the practice of, of throwing petals and uh, putting, fla you know, cut flowers there? Well, this is not the prophetic way, actually. But well, I'm not saying this is sinful. But sometimes people will exaggerate and then, you know, do too much of this. You can follow the prophetic guidance and put some uh, green uh, leaves and uh, plants. Living plants. We have several more questions on the chat, please. The first one is, can you give more than one third of your wealth to charity in your lifetime? In your lifetime, you can. If you didn't die straight after, because they can challenge it. If you were not in your uh, uh, severe illness and you died after that. But if you have no severe illness and you were just a normal, a healthy person and you donated half of your uh, wealth during your lifetime, can you? You can. That's fine. And Sheikh, you can give away everything if you want to as well? Yes, but this is not fair for your uh, heirs, actually, because, listen, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it happened with uh, Nu'man, not Nu'man, what's his name? Sa'ab bin Abi Waqqas, actually. Sa'ab bin Abi Waqqas, he was a wealthy man, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, you see, I'm very ill now, and I don't have not much children, and at that time, afterwards, he got plenty, but at that time, he has probably one uh, a child or two, max. So, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have plenty of wealth. I, I will donate all of my wealth. Prophet Sallallahu said, no, this is too much. He said, too sad. He said, no, too much. He said, half of it. He said, no, too much. He said, one third. Prophet Sallallahu said, one third and one third is too much, but it's allowed. This is where we got the one third. So, Sheikh, but presumably if uh, somebody can give away their wealth to their own heirs in their lifetime, Yes, but it's, uh, from experience, I tell you, it's not recommended. I right. came across some stories. Uh, they kicked their parents out of the house. Okay. Because it's not theirs anymore. Right. And uh, Sheikh, in terms of leaving um, to your grandchildren, uh, because the grandchildren will not inherit if the children are alive, so can they be gifted in the one third? They can, yes. Okay. And that would have to be done fairly as well? That would have to be done equally among them or not? Yes, definitely, yes. Okay. So now we have a question about, is it, um, can you make da'a for uh, non-Muslims to recover from illness? Of course, of course. The Prophet Sallallahu visited many non-Muslims as well and he made da'a for them, alayhi salatu and on the topic of the Ashik, um, what du'a do you recommend? Do you recommend praying for a long life or would you uh, qualify that du'a? A long life and good deeds. You can't just say long life. The Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ طَالَ عُمُرُهُ وَحَسُنَ عَمَلُهُ The best among you is the one with long life and good deeds. Not just long life. Long life and bad deeds, you don't need that long life and more, more bad deeds. You need short uh, life and minimum bad deeds. This is the logic. So yes, long life and, long, uh, and good deeds, yes, that's fine, of course. And for somebody who's not clinging to a long life, who doesn't necessarily want a long life, maybe they're ill, they don't want to have prolonged illness, can they ask for their lifespan to be shortened? They can in a, in the prophetic word. Allahumma ahini ma kanat al hayatu khayran li, wa amitni ma kan al mautu rahatan li or khayran li. So Allah, uh, make me live if life is better for me, or make me die if death is better for me. This is the, the prophetic way. Otherwise, you can't say, oh Allah, make me die. This is not allowed. So following on from the anxiety question, if you are overcome with thoughts and anxiety, is there anything you can recite and pray to alleviate that anxiety? 
Yes, of course. We have a blog on that. You can read the details, uh, the, the special dua which you recite. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal-hazan, wa'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasal, wa'udhu bika min al-jubni wal-bukhl, wa'udhu bika min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahri al-rijal. So yes, you ask Allah Azza wa Jal to relieve you from any anxiety from the hadith and uh, there are some verses as well you can recite which will give you relief insha'Allah ta'ala. Listening to the Quran will give you relief from anxiety. Uh, prolonging your sujood in your salah will give you relief from anxiety. Uh, helping and supporting those who are uh, poor and orphans and ask them to do dua for you will give you inshallah relief as well. So there are plenty of things you can do to get the relief, Bismillah. That's lots of lovely ideas there, Jazakumullah Khair and Sheikh. And also uh, the, the plants that you're talking about for the graveyard, do they need to be on top of the grave, beside the grave? Is there a specific location where it's best to place them? On the side of the grave will be fine. Okay. Depends and again on the regulations of the graveyard because they have some regulations and you have to meet these regulations. Okay, and what about watering the grave when you visit it? Is that prophetic? I can't remember anything like that, but uh, well, what it will do with the grave if you were to water it? It must be a cultural practice somewhere. And uh, the final question, Sheikh, is uh, can a non-Muslim be a witness for your will? No. And Sheikh, for somebody who is a revert, um, who can they leave their money to? Because if their family is not Muslim, where will their wealth go? Yeah, they can write it for some... It depends on this thing. I don't want to, to give a general... Uh, uh, if you want opinion, depends on the scenario which you have. Some of it, you might uh, even one third can go to non-Muslims. You can. Okay, Jazakumullah Khairan Sheikh. That was the last question for this evening. Jazakumullah uh, for this session and bringing comfort to all those who are struggling at this difficult time for also showing us how to purify ourselves and prepare for death. We look forward to hearing more in the next session about what happens to the soul of the deceased and what they experience. I'd like to thank Farhana, Zahra, Qasim Nawaz, Hassan Rasul, and all those who've helped behind the scenes. Um, I'd also like to remind people that we, you are doing Qiyam tomorrow, inshallah, uh, at 9 p.m. on your YouTube channel. For anybody who'd like more comfort and would like to join in that, please feel free to join that. I will post the link on the chat as well. Um, do keep checking the Sheikh's YouTube and the Uthraj website for our latest posts. And may Allah bless everyone who attended this session and may Allah use your load. Ameen. Ameen. Okay, we'll finish with that, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma ya Rabbi ya Rahman ya Badi'a al-Samawat wal-Ard. Ya ذا الجلال wal-Ikram. Ya ذا الجلال wal-Ikram. يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم إنا نسألك أن تغفر لنا ما قدمنا وما أخرنا وما أسرنا وما أعلنا وما أنت على به منا يا الله Help us to be prepared يا الله to meet you يا الله يا الله make us among those who love to meet you يا الله يا الله make us among those who love to meet you يا الله and help us to prepare for that meeting يا رب العالمين Forgive our sins, our mistakes, our shortcomings, accept our repentance, accept our repentance. Have mercy on those who left us, Ya Allah, from our dear beloved uh, friends or families or parents or children. Ya Rabbil Alameen, have mercy on them, shower them with your mercy, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Cure our illnesses and those who are suffering physically and mentally and spiritually. Ya Allah, cure all the illnesses. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Arham al -Rahimin. Provide us with the halal and put the barakah in it. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Keep us away from anything that displeases you, Ya Allah. Keep us on the straight path, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Arham al -Rahimin. Ya Arham al -Rahimin. Ya Arham al -Rahimin. 
purify our hearts, our intentions, make our deeds purely for your sake, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah. Salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Salatan turdika wa turdiha wa turda biha anna. Ameen, ameen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.